You introduced to our EFT list, it was on our website, about Pat Ahern, the baseball player. Yes. Okay. How's Pat doing? I spoke to him last night. He, um, I can't even remember the name of... See, I'm not very good on details. I can't even tell you the name of the, the organization he's playing with. But he has the best earn run average in the league. And this time he's in an organization where he has a chance of getting in the major league because the major league team is doing dismally and he's doing fantastically. Yeah, if you ever want to go to the, you just put Ahern, A-H-E-A-R-N-E, -E into the search engine on our website and you'll see this article there and you'll see his before and after statistics. This was done yeah. some two or three years ago and he's improved since then, I guess. He's actually, um, what happened was he was, um, I met him, I was working for the Perth Heat baseball team as our local professional team. Um, he was uh, visiting with us. I worked with him and his earn run average went from 3.3, I think it was, to 0.87 for the rest of that season. Which after is unheard of, by the way, for those who don't know baseball. The lower the number is like golf. The lower yeah. the number, the better. But to go from 3.87 to under one is... is Essentially, had, he had a couple of games in that part of the season which were near, near shutouts, which means he pitched the whole game and nobody hit a run off him the whole game. And that was pretty good. Sure. He did have one or two hits, but that's about it. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, you are going to spend the morning on EFT and peak performance, including sports and business. Business. Okay. And whatever. And I'm going to leave that yeah. to you. Thank you, sir. Okay. It's a great privilege to be here. Thank you very much, Gary, for inviting me. And I have to acknowledge Gary. Um, he has really given us the springboard to be able to realize our dreams. And this is part of my dream. And uh, thank you for being part of it. I hope we can uh, do some things together to help each other go to the next level because that's really what it's about. And um, I think everyone here, it doesn't matter who you are, there's a next level for you. It doesn't matter whether it's in your family, about improving the relationships in your family, or if it's in your business and you want to open up a practice or you want to improve your practice or whatever it is, um, if it's in sports. In fact, I'm interested just to find out who is actually, um, you're here so you want to do something. Who is interested in focusing on business? I thought so. Okay. I asked for people to come up yesterday and um, I had 18 people come, wanted to do a one-on-one -on -one session and um, I won't have time to work with all of those people but about 10 of them had as their issue, I want to build my practice, I want to build my business. So I'm definitely going to focus on some of that. In fact, there are a lot of parallels. Who is interested in sports? Not just watching but I mean improving. Um, now I need to dis differentiate there. Who's interested in their own personal sports performance? Okay. And who is interested in helping others with sports performance? Okay, some of the same hands. That's quite a lot of people. Excellent. So we're all going to get into peak performance work with athletes. Fantastic. Okay. Now, um, I'm also going to talk a little bit about building that side of the business uh, because I know that a lot of people are interested in that. But what I want to start out doing is just giving you some of my basic ideas about this because um, I think peak performance is a choice. It's a decision that you make, and um, it's really essential to have some of the thinking patterns and understand some of the principles about what makes people achieve and what, what, what allows people to realize whatever dreams they set. And, uh, you know, to me, I've been getting into manifestation. This is such a wonderful thing, and um, this is part of that, and thank you for being part of that. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit that I know. I don't know everything. Frank Farrelly said to me, those who are in second grade can help those who are in first grade, and those who are in first grade can help those who are in kindergarten. So I might be just heading into the second grade, just checking to see my report card. Um, but hopefully there's some of you who actually uh, that will be helpful for. So I'll share what I know and what I do. I don't think I know everything, but I do know some things and I've found them very useful. Um, I'll talk about a few of my experiences in sports and relate those as well as in business because I have done a lot of corporate work as well and I've presented EFT in the corporate setting and had it, had it work from groups such as refinery workers through to accountants, um, the full range of people in different settings in corporate, um, from CEOs down to frontline workers. Okay? So we'll talk about that and we'll also talk about um, your practice issues. Who's, by the way, this is a common one, who's got money issues? <laughs> Me too! Now, still working on this, all right, but we're getting better. And so, uh, again, I, I, I might be in about first grade there. But those of you who are in kindergarten, I might be able to share something with you, maybe help you along a little bit. And we can all help each other to go to the next level. So let me just give you a few uh, philosophical things, if you like. I believe, as I've just mentioned, that peak performance is a choice that you actually have to decide. By the way, can you see this? 
Well, then, you, if you want to read what I'm saying, you're going to have to move now. Please do that. Please move so you can get closer. I'm sure these people at the closer tables will not mind if you come and join them. Because I'm, I am going to put some things up. I need to be able to... It's the only way to clarify my thinking sometimes. So uh, if you want to see what I'm writing, I will be speaking it as well. Is that a bad spot for me to stand? Um, I will be speaking it as well, but I'm going to write some things up here. Now, the challenge is, who has trouble deciding? First step. I don't know what I want. I don't know what I should be doing. You know, a couple of the issues that people put down on my, my thing were that. Maybe we can start doing this from the start and making it interactive, because what I wanted... I'm going to try and cover a whole bunch of bases. I apologise for those of you who are linear, linear, digital, logical, sequential people who like structure. Okay, you're going to be frustrated a little in my presentation, because I'm going to try and cover a whole bunch of areas and uh, we're going to see how far we get, and we're going to do as much as we can in the time that we have. And I promise I'll give you my total focus on that and give you as much as I can in the time that we have available. So um, somebody who has that issue, maybe we can start from the beginning. Just come up to the microphone and let's hear what the challenge is here. What stops you from being able to decide? What stops you at that point when I say deciding is the issue? Oh, very good. First person on my list. Excellent. Now, I've completely forgotten your name, but I remember your face. Well, I think one of the things is, first of all, I'm really good at, at EFT. I get really good results on pain. That was a cue when I said I forgot your name. Pat. Pat. I'm sorry. Thank you, Pat. I didn't hear you say that. Okay. I'm sorry. Um, I love doing corporate training. Um, I love doing anything where I see transformational results. Uh, okay. I'm, I'm an author. I love writing. So it's like, well, okay, I need to go here. I okay, need to go here. I need, you know. And I came across this. Oh, you've got all these tool. areas where you want to go. You love it all. I love it all. Yeah. All it's right. It's not like I'm doing stuff that says, oh, God, I have to do this, except straighten my desk. But yeah. But anyway, um, you know, I love doing corporate training. Um, I like selling. I have a particular assessment tool that's about emotional intelligence. It's very much about what we all do. Mm. And it's like, well, I just need to make money. <laughs> <laughs> All right, yes, it can seem like that, yes, absolutely. That, you, you heard the thing, do what you love, the money will follow? Not yeah, necessarily. Yeah, doing what I love. The money isn't what? even necessarily in the area, you know, it could be somewhere completely else. I, I found in, in business you've actually got to have a part of you that focuses on that, absolutely. But there's got to be the part of you that focuses on the main game. And if you don't have that, if you only have the focus on the money, and that can be caused by not having enough. You're saying if you don't have the focus on the money... I'm saying you've got to have a part of you and part of your business that focuses on that, the manager, if you like, okay. of your business, if you're going into business, okay? okay? And this is, you know, this is a challenge. For me, going into business was a challenge. I came from a welfare background, you know, I was in a salary position, and it was like, hey, you know, I'm not used to having to worry about this side of things. I just want to help people. Yeah. And the challenge is if the technician, who's read the E-myth? The E-myth. In fact, if you're going to get that book, get the E-Myth Revisited, which is the updated version of the E-Myth, and it's by Michael Gerber, spelled G-E-R. I'm trying my best American accent. How am I doing? B-E-R. <laughs> Gerber. <laughs> and he says technicians go into business. There's a myth that entrepreneurs start businesses, but technicians start businesses, people who like to do the stuff, okay? challenge is if your technician is in charge of your business, the wrong person is running it. You need to have the entrepreneur part of you, and you need to have the manager part of you, and you need to have the technicians doing the business, doing the stuff, doing the work, okay? It needs to be a balance of those. So we're going to come back to you, Pat, if that's okay, all right? Thank you very much. Just wanted to get some quick ideas now, yeah? Uh, for me, for instance, I have been my whole life into business, and I was a very good businesswoman, and since I'm doing healing work, and this is what I love doing, and I believe in do what you do, and the money will follow. So last year I decided I'm not going to do any more interior decorating, which is what was my main source of income, and I'm going to do only classes and one-on-one -on -one healing work and coaching and stuff, and the money was not there. Yeah. So then, now I'm doubting. I said to myself, so what am I doing? Not charging. Not charging you enough? You thought about asking for money for what you do. Yeah, not enough, no. Yeah. And I feel bad to ask for money. Yes. All right. So these are some of the issues that we're going to right. look at. But I'm not going to get into the treatment stuff too much at the moment. I just want to get some of the issues. Yeah? 
well in answer to the question of what makes what makes it hard to decide i'm not actually trying to run a business currently but i i'm an employee and i everything seems important so i can't ever get rid of anything i have an office stuffed i have a house stuffed and it's like how do you decide i don't know how do you decide what's important? Yeah, yeah, yeah this is it a seems like everything it? is important. Yeah, everything is important, but it, but not as much. Right. People say, you know, uh, you change one part of the system, it'll change the rest of the system. But some parts of the system, you change them and you wouldn't notice much right. effect on the system. <laughs> okay, so what's the, what's, the, what's the outcome that you're after with this? What is it that you want to achieve ultimately with that? What's it going to do if you get that? I mean, mm-hmm. what would be worth getting organised for? Good question. You know? Yeah. Being and effective. Are, yeah, but being... What, what is effective? What is it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So anyway, there's a lot of tapping, but when you've got all those conflicting things, these are conflicting values as well in yourself. Mm-hmm. And I had this for many years. I set up my business. I always wanted to do personal development programs, large scale, make a difference. And, uh, and yet I found that that's what everybody wants to do. Everybody who, you know, well, almost every, I get into National Speakers Association. It seems like everybody wants to do this. And uh, it's like, well, who am I really to think I can do this? You know, look at all these guys doing that. And uh, also, how can you get people to buy this? You know, how can you get people to pay money for this? How can you get people to actually pay enough for you to eat? And, um, and I had a lot of things that I could do really well, so I started out just doing those, and I'm running programs of those, and I enjoyed them, I was good at them, they got results, and it felt good, but it was always my number two. It was never my number one. And it always felt like I'm not quite doing it. Every time I got out there in front of the group, it felt good. This is your issue too. Feels really good, but it's not your number one. I call that a hundred percent yes. That's when you actually, when you think about doing something, you get a hundred percent yes. I'm not talking about, you know, you might have fear. If fear is the only thing stopping it from being a hundred percent yes, then it's still a hundred percent yes. Okay. And the fear is what needs to be treated. Not knowing isn't the issue. Because if you actually deal with the, the, get rid of the fear, it's easy to find the information. The information is there. Last one, Stephen. Yeah. Well, Someone. Steve, I think you know I'm a recovering investment banker. Uh, yeah. And having, I'm a recovering having, psychologist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> having spent 30 years seeing opportunities and, you know, seizing opportunities, much like Pat, what I've found changed, you know, the evolution of my career to wanting to work with people. I see so many opportunities, and yet I, you know, they all look great. And I, I'm still in the struggle of which ones should I follow that will produce the necessary return. Yeah. I look at the return. I'm bottom line oriented. But I'll tell you, the bottom line seems, seems like a vacuum many times. Uh, and in my own business, the, 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 the challenge I'm having is to stay focused on things that I, in my heart, believe in. Yeah. But they're not producing the thing that pays the rent and keeps, you know, keeps me in one of my hands. Well, habits, that may be a block in your belief about whether that's possible to have those two together. Okay. But that, that impairs my decision-making process. Yeah, because you think if I follow my heart, I can't eat. Yeah. And I can't provide yeah. or whatever. And, and, I have, and I seem to have proof of that. Yes. Well, you don't seem to. You actually do. Yeah. Yeah. There is real proof in your experience and, and in the world. Yes. Right. Absolutely. And there are all these false associations that are created. So it's like everybody's trying to tell us, this is success. Come here, have this, do this. This is going to give you the feelings that you want. And they're tugging you and pulling you all sort of directions. And we really have to treat that because it's a false, it's a wizard of Oz. It really is. You know, we're from Oz, but I think that the greatest, you know, the greatest wizard of Oz, it really is an American story, isn't it? It really is the American thing of like, you know, we'll paint the picture like this and then you'll all, you know, come and do it but behind the thing there's just you know never mind the man behind the curtain i love that movie you know it's like <laughs> metaphor for existence isn't it so well, yeah it's one way you can start is to get all your options and say i really want to do this and tap on i really want to do this and then tap on another one i really want to do this because some of that wanting is actually an anxious wanting as well oh very definitely yeah very definitely it sort of sees sees the opportunity of the moment because that's going to make a buck. That's going to turn a buck. And I mean, that's, sure. that's, that's how I've spent my entire career. Well, maybe so that's I'll, number one. Well, but it doesn't get, I don't get the same juice. I don't get the same satisfaction level sometimes. Well, you can have juice and poverty. <laughs> or you can have no juice and riches. That's and that, the only choice you got, Stephen. Yeah. <laughs> and that, let me tell you, that's the dilemma. 
Do you got it? That's the dilemma. Yeah. All right. Well, now you can just work on those. We're going to talk, I'll talk a bit about how you treat those belief systems and stuff like that, and hopefully get into it. And you, you, I'm going to leave it up to you to do some work on this. I have promised Gary we won't be doing whole group tapping too much today. It needs to give you a bit of a rest on that. But we will actually get some people up to the microphones and do some tapping with them, um, see what happens. Okay? If, you, if you particularly want to tap on that issue, go ahead. Okay? Thanks, All right. Steve. Let me just continue here. I, I, I start and then, and then get distracted. So I want to, want to give you just a little bit of a picture. When I was um, 17 years old, I was majoring in socializing, having a good time, avoiding work, um, going out with my friends, and um, we really did. We were like anti-study. And if you were caught studying in our group, or you know anybody thought that you had actually done some work, you know you were just ostracized. So um, this was all very good until the results started to stack up against me. And we have a, a, a tertiary entrance examinations. They were, were called the tertiary admissions examinations at that time. And it was based on the entire two years work. You do these exams. And then you have this mock one just beforehand, and which is a practice. And it was about 10 weeks before. And I comprehensively failed. <laughs> and that was probably the first time I started to think this may not be working. <laughs> so um, I remember actually. Uh, what do you call, what do they call wagging school over here when you truant? Okay, I'm truanting one day. We're lining up outside a, 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 a concert venue for tickets to a group named Kiss. And um, I didn't actually like the band. I was just going with my friends, you know. And, um, well, the truth be known, I never went to the movie. I became a scalper and sold the tickets because I needed the money so much. Okay. Anyway, um, for some reason, there ended up being a teacher in that group in the afternoon. Someone had saved a place for him, and he was standing next to us. And we were talking to him, my friend and I, about our situation, which was pretty similar. And at one point, he turned around to me. He said, gee, you know, that's a real shame. He said, you know, you'll never recover. And, and even then, I'm, I'm 17 years old, I'm thinking, this guy's a real motivator. <laughs> and, um, but I thought... How could you have such a, how could you be a teacher and have such, I could see he had a limited view. I knew my life wasn't over. I, I knew that that was ridiculous. But part of me, of course, was believing this. So anyway, I'm thinking, I want to prove you wrong, you so-and-so. But I, I, I didn't know how to do that. I was so far down the toilet that I didn't know what I was going to do. I'm going to try and keep my language. Uh, we, we come from convict stock, so I, I have to apologize. <laughs> And I spent a lot of time working with emotionally disturbing children um, <laughs> whose language, language is quite distorted. And uh, so I've been a little bit desensitized to it. So I, I'll try and keep my mouth you know, above the gutter uh, for you. But anyway, what the hell was I talking about? <laughs> OK, the teacher. So anyway, I was, I, was, I was actually quite depressed, I think, at the time. But I remember lying, in, uh, lying on the lounge in the lounge room one day and just thinking, what the hell am I going to do, you know? And uh, my dad had lots of books. And in the bookshelf, I, I was just saw the, this book, um, spine. spine, yes, thank you. I need help with the language. Uh, and, and, it, and I picked it up and just started reading this book. And all of a sudden, it was like my eyes opened. That book was called Think and Grow Rich. Who's read that book? Ah, isn't that, wow, you're above average, this group. Wow, look at the numbers. Isn't that incredible? Well, that was a defining moment for me because uh, all of a sudden I could see that this wasn't just something you had to make up as you go along. That this is actually, um, that there is a formula that you can follow if you want to that will work. That the road has been paved for you. And um, for those of you who don't know, Napoleon Hill basically was, uh, he met Andrew Carnegie who was a multi-millionaire in the steel industry in this country. And uh, Andrew Carnegie said, look, I know what's made me successful. I think it should be taught in schools. I, I, I want to tell you my philosophy of success. And I want you to go and I'll give you letters of introduction to the top achievers in this country. And you can go around and learn from them and put that into a program and, um, you know, get it out there. And he said, you know, if you'd like to do that, I'm happy to give you those letters of introduction. I'm not going to pay you anything, but I think it'll take about 20 years of your life. So Napoleon Hill said, yeah, I'll do that. And... Um, and he did that, and the sum of that was actually a 16-volume set called Law of Success. And he, he got to meet people like Henry Ford, Thomas Edison, you know, Roosevelt, 
uh, I can't remember all the names, Woolworth, you know, Frank Woolworth, all the, the major achievers of the time in a variety of areas. And he was able to summarize the, the, their strategies and their philosophy into a basic formula uh, of 16 major elements, which he put into the law of success. And then he summarized that into think and grow rich. And I read that when I was 17, and it changed my whole life. I, I, I thought, okay, I've got nothing to lose. I've got 10 weeks, and it should be impossible for me to turn this around. And I have to tell you, the moment that you actually make that commitment, that's when everything happens. That's when everything changes. That's when the impossible becomes possible. Now, the challenge that we all have is getting to the point of taking that committed step where you say, okay, that's what I'm going to do. We're talking about Pat Ahern. Pat, I met with Pat in my office. Um, actually, I met him on the baseball field. Um, I helped him with a couple of challenges he had in his game. Instantly, he got very interested. Okay? If you're going to work with sports people, you, you, you'll always find a part of their game that is their biggest problem area. You, you do a little bit of work with that. Then they get some relief. They want to, they want to know, hey, you know, give me some more of that. I think I want to, <laughs> I want to do that. And uh, I was asked this question once we get beyond that first step. Where do you want to go ultimately? What do you want to do with this ultimately? And he was you know, almost embarrassed. He said, well, you know, I, I, I'd really like to see if I can get up to the major league. And I said, all right, why don't you decide to do that? And he did. And it's a challenge because do, is he going to do that? Is he going to achieve that? Does he know for 100% that he's going to be in the major leagues in this country? No. The challenge is, he's actually made that decision and he said, okay, I'm not going to live my life, get to the end of my life and then think, what would have happened if I went for it? What would have happened if that thing that I had in my heart that was just tugging at me saying, come on, what about this? What about that? What if I, you know, what if I didn't go for it? And the challenge is that you've actually got to make your decision to do it before you know how you're going to get there. And that's what stops all sorts of people. The little thing called doubt. And I actually think this is what EFT is ideal for dealing with. Okay? We've got doubts and fears. And um, actually, a lot of the fears are not just fear of failure. They're fear of success. And I, I reckon a large chunk of my work is actually dealing with fear of success. People think about being in the success state, and they, and they just can't. It just feels foreign to them. It just doesn't feel right. And that's what you've got to treat. So you've actually got to get to the point where being in the major leagues feels comfortable. Pat's actually achieved that. There's no real need in the material world for him to go any further with, with where he's gone. He knows what he is. Okay? Now, it would be really nice to have the, 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 the cream on the cake for that you know, to be realized. And, hey, to keep applying the things as, as um, Gary was saying, does it lead you in directions? Yeah, of course it does. Okay? And uh, I believe it's going to work for him. And in fact, he, was, he, has a, he has one of the top pitching gurus in the country. And uh, he's gone through a very big struggle. This is one of the challenges with peak performance. People see the, the overnight success and they don't see all the preparation and the planning and the struggle and the ups and the downs. And the, the, you know, he got into an organization where he performed really well. And they actually wrote an article in the paper that said any other year, any other organization, he would have been in the major league that year. So he's gone through that. He's gone through being the king of, of, you know, what's the word? He called himself something like the king of denied opportunity. You know? Who's got that one? Who knows about that? Yeah, sure. Okay? And this is the challenge. If you've failed before, if you've had, you know, pain before, there can be a challenge about moving forward. Okay. Let's move on here. Let me just give you another couple of parts of this picture. I believe our, the decision point is actually to do with addressing the doubts and fears. And you've got to use some techniques to do that. And the best technique that I know is using EFT. Okay? Until you address all this, and if another word for that, another term for that is limiting views of what's possible for you or your business. You have to break through the barriers about what you think is possible for you or your business. And that's where you need to apply EFT to your ideas about what you can and cannot do. Okay? Man, 
It's in the handout. Yes, thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> Step two in the handout. Thank you. Let me get the handout and I can read it out to you because once I've said it, it's gone, okay? I tell my clients, you don't have to worry about confidentiality with me. As soon as... You... <laughs> this is not the spot. How's that? Very good. Now, I'm going to read you the handout that you have. <laughs> Step two to peak performance, break through the barriers. Overcome your limiting ways of thinking about what's possible for you or your business. Now, this could be an entire seminar on its own, okay? Because this is really the issue. And when I, uh, when I start to get into my process, I'm going I'm to... Uh, I'm going to give you some techniques for dealing with those belief challenges. By the way, I only have a couple of colours. Those of you who are very visual and want the coloured pens, I can't do that today. All right? So you're just going to have to imagine this is purple, okay? <laughs> Beliefs, okay? Now, then you can go do your goal setting because until you've done some work on your own blocks and barriers about what's possible, you shouldn't really be setting your goals because you're only going to set your goals based on your limited box about what you think is possible. So you need to treat yourself for, for what you think is possible for you first, okay? To realize that you can actually open up and achieve your goals. You can actually do this. See, there's, there's the limits that you have about what you think is possible for you. I think an even huger limit in the whole world is that we think we have to limit ourselves to what other people have done. And that's, that, it's, that's just going to leave us with the is, okay? And really want to realize much more than that. So there's, there's all sorts of boxes within boxes that you need to get through before you get to setting your goals. And I'm, I'm always interested, as I say, in what are your ultimate goals? Where do you want to go ultimately with this? You know, when I ask that, sometimes I'm the first person that's asked that. Ask that. <laughs> Not ask, it sounds like <laughs> something else. I'm the first person that asks that sometimes, okay? And, and people haven't actually, they're running, it's like, um, who said you, you go to sleep and you wake up 40? I think it was Dennis Whateley. <laughs> Isn't that the way it happens? And it all just happens. And then at some point you realize, hey, I can consciously create this. And this is a moment to do that. This is what we're here for today. To take a moment to look at conscious creation. Because we've been driven by all sorts of unconscious desires and stuff that's programmed in and so on. And we really can start to take control of that. Yeah. As far as setting goals, because I think that probably everybody in this room has read many personal development books, so on and so forth, but I think it's easier said than done. So I'm another one of those people, too. It's like a big picture, but in order to hone in, I find very challenging. Yeah. You know, so how do you go, do you have a methodology for treating that? Yes, I do. And what I'm going to, what I'm going to, my aim is actually to show you some of the stuff about treating beliefs and then we'll actually go through a process of uh, manifestation goal setting. We might be able to do the entire workshop that I do in our seminars, but I'm actually going to give you a bit of an overview of that if we have time, as much as possible. Um, and I think the issue, I and mean, there's a number of issues, there's internal civil war, conflicting values, conflicting beliefs that we need to get through. Um, but I used to do a goal setting thing with some friends of mine. We'd get together every year we get together at the, you know, the start of the year, the end of the year, and we check up on our goals. And uh, they, they were into these incredible, they mapped their goals out, and they had these charts, and they had timelines, and they had, you know, this leads to this. And it's like, wow. I've just got a list. <laughs> and then we get together at the end of the year, and I would think, how come I've achieved 95% of the goals I set, and they've achieved maybe 15%? And then I thought about it, I thought the reason why is because just about all of my goals are things that I really want to do now. I don't set goals for things that I don't want to do anymore, you know. I've, I've done that a lot in the past, and it's like, why isn't this working? Well, that wasn't what I, I thought I wanted to do that, but I didn't really want to do that, okay. If you've got something that you're unsure whether you really want to do it, do some tapping on really wanting to do it, and do some tapping on the other side of not wanting to do it. Part of you wants to do it, and part of you doesn't. And when you do tapping on, on the objection, you'll start to find out what the issues really are. And that might be very informative because it might be saying, no, don't climb that ladder. It's against the wrong wall. Wall. <laughs> okay. Now, we're going to move on here. I've, I, I, I've, 
I've mentioned, I'm, I'm actually ahead of myself because I actually believe there's no such thing as goal setting without clarifying your values. If you're not really clear on what's most important to you, then you may end up thinking that something's going to give you what you want and it doesn't. A few years ago, I actually, we wanted to extend our house. I thought it was important for my family. I set a goal to double my income. I actually exceeded that goal. And I also more than doubled my workload. And I'm thinking, wow, here I am. I've done all this. We've got the money for the extension. This is great, but I'm not home. I'm not there. And that's my number one. You know, I really want to make a difference. I want to be out, out in the world making a difference. But I know now that if I'm doing that and I am not being there for my family, then it's just a waste of time. It's not going to give me what I want ultimately. And so I had to actually come to the point where I realized, um, you know, I've got to allow the space and the time for both of these. Is there a way to do this? Yes, because, uh, you know, the people who earn 10 times more than you work 10 times as much as you. It's not possible. So they must be doing something else. They must have another way for that to happen. So we now get to the point where I have some specific limits about how much travel I'm going to do, how much time I'm going to be away from my family, and everything has to fit into that. Okay? When we come away internationally, I have a two-week window. We do three international trips a year. That works for me. If I go away from my family for more than 14 days, I know everything falls to pieces for me and for them. After about eight or nine days, I start to feel like I want to go home. You know, so that's, that's, that's it. And that works for me. And so that now I have to think, how can, I actually, how can I actually leverage what I do? And now we actually we have more places offered to us than we can possibly go to, and that's a great problem to have because now we can focus on what's going to be the best stuff to do. Back then what I did was I said, okay, I want to get the same income as I had last year and I want to work 75% of what I worked last year. And that was, that was what happened at that time, Okay. Now, we've gone through different, you know, everything goes through stages. You've got to clarify what's important to you. Have you asked yourself, what's most important to me in my life? Just reflect on that for a moment. What is most important to you in your life? Maybe you want to ask yourself how much time you spent on that yesterday. That's like, well, we were here. How could I spend some time on it? But... How much time did you spend on it the week before? How much money did you spend on this? How much of whatever resources you have to put into something did you put into what's most important? Because if you say it's important and then you do it's not important, it isn't really important to you. Several years ago, I went to a personal development seminar. It was a fantastic seminar, but I was sick when I went. And during the seminar, I clarified that one of my highest values was health. What a joke. During the seminar, I collapsed. And I came home. It took me several weeks to recuperate. And I realized the real seminar was what I was doing to my own health. Pushing, you know, pushing, forcing. So I've learned a little bit about that. You know, I try not to get into that now. Mark Victor Hansen says, failure to live your values is not a setback. It's a real failure. You know, Mark Victor Hansen, isn't he a great guy? Who knows Mark Victor Hansen of Chicken Soup for the Soul fame, you know, with Jack Canfield? These guys took their uh, original idea to 33 publishers. We 